So what is the advantage of looking at the population distribution? So this range goes from under 15, 15 to 44 and 45 plus. So the top ranges are in the 80s. And if you look at the developing nations, under 15, the bottom of the pyramid is quite solid. So there's a large number of young people in developing countries. What is the use? So if you look at the statistics of the total fertility rate versus percentage of girls enrolled in secondary schools from the data from UNESCO. You can see that as the percentage of girls that are enrolled in secondary school goes up, the fertility rate drops. So it's been known now for some time that educating women, educating girls is one of the best contraceptives. When you say contraceptives, there are all kinds of debate from religious side and so on. But nonetheless, uh, considering the population issue, you have to worry about this. And this has proven to be very useful to look at the fertility rates, for example, in the 1970s versus. And if you can read this carefully, this is the blue colors are in the range of one to two children. So. A woman having two children is obviously considered the replacement rate because a couple has two kids, then the population is stable. So you can see that for places like India, China and a lot of countries in uh, Africa, the drop is quite significant. There was a one child policy imposed here which has been relaxed recently and so on. But nonetheless, the growth of population is still going on because you started with the big population but the fertility rates have dropped which means the population is going to start decreasing at some point. So the projections for the future are always a little bit uncertain. So keeping that in mind and the consumption rates, the main message I would give is that population growth, uh, population as a whole is an important aspect of climate change. We do have to worry about it in terms of habitat destruction or encroaching on habitats for tigers, elephants, etc. But unless consumption is brought down, nothing else is going to change. So consumption is the key issue. That can be looked at also in terms of how we move developing countries into developed countries. So this is showing something called the United Nations Human Development Index, usually referred to as HDI, which includes education of women, children's health, per capita GDP, access to health care, and so on and so forth. And not surprisingly, on this scale, we have uh, the ecological footprint measured in gigahectares. So it's kind of a measure of how much of the Earth's surface a country ends up using for its consumption. So if you look at all the developing countries from Niger to Sh Chad, Guinea, Mali, Gambia, and so on, they're all bunched in here. So you can see that the blue colors are European Union, North America is in green. So the countries that are developed and rich from Norway to France to Belgium and Sweden, they have a very high human development index, obviously, but they also have a very high environmental footprint, right? So how do you move these countries? Do you have to go to high HDI by increasing the environmental footprint or is there a way to just, do you go this way or is there a way to go this way? This is the quadrant that is considered sustainable development quadrant where you keep the environmental footprint low and you increase the human development index. So how to accomplish this? That's going to be a challenge. There was an assumption that there is something like a, what is called a Kuznets curve, which means the if you put environmental footprint versus per capita GDP, GDP per capita, then it looks something like this, that when people are getting rich, they will increase their environmental footprint, but once they get rich enough, they become very conscientious about the environment and then they begin to reduce their environmental footprint. This has not really worked out that way, except maybe Norway, which is sitting here, which has got a high HDI and a low environmental footprint, but most other rich countries have high environmental footprint despite having increased their per capita GDP and overall GDP. So 
we have to just keep an eye on how it is that these economies will grow in the coming years and decades. So I will slowly transition to show some of the kinds of solutions that may come along as we go into the future before we start looking at the take home points. These are some of the messages that I just picked from recent headlines. This is from August uh, and this is from July of this year 2018 and this is a figure that is showing a exciting experiment. This one says future of food. Scientists have found a fast and cheap way to edit your food's DNA. That's obviously the GMO business, lots of controversies, but there are lots of exciting ideas that maybe food will be grown in labs, maybe there will be hydroponics, so considering ocean has so much area on this planet, 70% of the surface area, if there is a way to grow our food on water instead of on land, can we solve the food security issues without degrading the environment, water quality and groundwater depletion and so on needs to be seen. But even things like urban farming are growing huge in the number of uh, people implementing them in cities and so on. And here is an example of biodiversity conservation. Scientists create embryos, hope to save near extinct rhino. Right? Early on I mentioned that maybe if there is a coral that's responding positively or not wilting under global warming and there is a coral that is suffering damage, then is there a way to combine the two to save corals? So these are the kinds of experiment. This is releasing mosquitoes carrying bacteria called Wolbachia in a town in, uh, Aust in Townsville in Australia. This bacteria when implanted into the mosquito, it basically prevents the spread of the malaria through people. So, so these mosquitoes, in fact, they are embedded with Wolbachia bacteria, which prevents the mosquitoes from spreading malaria was released into Townsville in Australia uh, from February 15 and they tracked the number of mosquitoes and the spread of disease like dengue. And you can see that compared to a previous data on acquired dengue cases and imported dengue cases, the Wolbachia coverage increased, the number of dengue cases dropped. So these are kind of experiments that uh, seem like they are very exotic, but nonetheless it's clear that the genetic knowledge and the ecosystem knowledge is becoming so good now that Genes are operating at a very small scale and ecosystems, humans and uh, mosquitoes and so on are operating on large scales, especially if you include migration, they operate at planetary scales. So they are being combined now to maybe control spread of diseases and so on. So, so what is being done uh, ne in the next phase of, uh, a, of the IPCC assessment and future projections? Obviously the next one that is coming is the AR6 which is the assessment report 6 which will be released starting in 2020 to 2021. So on top of the RCPs that were created for AR5, now there are so called shared socio-economic pathways that will be meshed with the RCPs. So they will aim at the socio-economic challenges for mitigation and socio-economic challenges for adaptation. So as we go into the future, obviously constraining CO2 emissions and warming to the goal of less than 2 degrees centigrade and so on will become more and more critical. So many scenarios are created which we won't go into the details. So on this end, you have low challenges, so you are mostly sustainable. As you go in this direction where adaptation is high but mitigation is low, then you get some people benefiting but some people not benefiting, so inequality increases. In the middle you have what is called the middle of the road where you have some level of adaptation, some level of mitigation, so it may be less unequal and it may be less sustainable and it's also better than conventional development where we have not worried so much about emissions, kind of like the baseline scenarios we talked about in RCPs and AI5. So the challenges here will begin to increase. The challenges to reducing emissions and so on will be low here. The challenges to adaptation will be high here, but mitigation is low. 
and this one here where you have what is called fragmentation basically you have high challenges to both adaptation and mitigation. There are many details that, that I will not go into, but you can imagine that this process is becoming more and more sophisticated as well as complicated. So, that is where you have local cooperation versus global cooperation and so on and so forth. So, this is also now being extended into agriculture specific pathways, because the previous one was focused more on socio-economics of adaptation and mitigation, these is more sector specific. So, this will take the RC SSPs, so the shared socio-economic pathways combine with the agricultural pathways and then do iterations to optimize crops, livestock, economic and so on based on a bunch of different models. So, the RCPs SSPs and RAPs will all begin to interact with each other, keeping still in mind things like GDPs and population policy, etcetera. So, they will also do global RAPs and regional RAPs and so on that are called representative agricultural pathways RAPs. Okay. Fisheries, another big part of the food security and food supply issue on at a global level, also is considering economy, governance and management. As I have said already a couple of times, fisheries is a very different problem. It is out there in the open ocean where enforcing rules and regulations is not easy and it is very different than agriculture because there is no input and output. There is just a system that is growing and being affected by acidification, warming, deoxygenation, etc. So, this looks at the population growth, GDP and fishing costs versus things like wild fish demand, the shape of emerging economies, developed countries and developing countries, corporate influence because the fishing industry is heavily dominated by industrial fisheries and large scale canneries that can tuna fish and so on and so forth. So, the importance of sustainability is obviously considered as well. So, it takes RCPs and also keeps SSPs in mind, because the so called ocean socioeconomic pathways are based on managing both the ecosystems and socio ecosystems. In other words, the future projections not necessarily all in AR6, AR6 will have SSPs, but not the RAPs yet uh, and definitely not the OSPs. Okay? So, let us begin to wind down this section on future projections. We mentioned early on that Spontea Arrhenius was one of the first ones to develop the concept of hothouse theory back in 1896, just a couple of decades after industrial revolution became born and the coal burning began to ramp up for transportation and the cars were beginning to just appear, shipping industry was taking off and so on and so forth. So, he noticed that the coal burning is beginning to create carbonic acid already and he made a prediction that time that already the, the temperature of the ground and air is going to be influenced and he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1903. And in 1912, you can see that there was a headline that talked about coal consumption affecting climate. This is more than a hundred years ago. So, here we are discussing it and this will be discussed for a long time, but already some calculations were being made about how much coal is being burned and how this is affecting climate already. That was more than a hundred years ago. So, in that context, we looked at all the time scales of climate change and we have been looking at future projections and just how complicated the process is. So, let us look at what the IPCC itself puts out as summaries for policy makers, so that people do not read the several thousand page long IPCC report. I would not expect you to read either other than maybe select specific pieces of it, but you will most certainly probably end up reading the summary for policy makers and the synthesis report which is about 200 pages. So, observed changes and their causes, we have mentioned that human influence on the climate system is clear. Recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on natural systems. So, this confidence is very high. Observed changes in the climate system include 
warming of the climate system, which is now unequivocal. And since 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. Atmosphere and ocean have warmed, amount of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen. So, all the evidences are in, we looked at some of those already. The causes of climate change, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have increased since the pre-industrial era. We have very accurate and precise data for that, driven largely by economic and population growth. Again, as I said, you have to remember who emitted most of the greenhouse gases, but how it is ramping up more recently. So, how do we assign? Do we worry about historic emissions or do we start to take action based on who is emitting how much now since lay, say net 1990s. Okay? This has led to atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide that are unprecedented or last 800,000 years that we know from the Antarctic ice core. Their effects together with those of other anthropogenic drivers like land use change have been detected throughout the climate system and are extremely likely to have been the dominant cause of observed warming. So, we said that when we say extremely likely, the confidence level is around 99 percent, right? 95 to 99 percent. So, these words are negotiated words at the IPCC where all country representatives uh, sit together and decide on what is acceptable as a whole. Impacts of climate change, recent decades changes in climate have caused impacts on natural and human systems on all continents and across all oceans. We saw nice graphic depictions of that through various systems and sectors. Impacts are due to observed climate change irrespective of its cause, indicating the sensitivity of natural and human systems to changing climate. So, we have to say irrespective of climate of its cause because even though we are extremely confident of human impact, we must always be aware that even if we do not agree on what caused the change, the sensitivity of the system is very high. So, we might face irreparable damage in any case. Extreme events, we talked a little bit, we look at it in more details in the monsoon case. Changes in many extreme weather and climate events have been observed since about 1950. Some of these changes have been linked to human influences including a decrease in cold temperature extremes, an increase in warm temperature extremes, increase in extreme high sea level, increase in the number of heavy precipitation events in a number of regions. So, this is distributed unevenly over the regions and this is why we have to be able to project exactly where they will get worse and in what form. Extreme winter storms versus extreme summer storms, extreme cyclones, tornadoes, extreme storm surges, inundations and so on. So, in this section, in the science part, that was the summary for policy makers, but from the science side, it is stated slightly differently. Human influence on climate system is clear and recent anthropogenic emission of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. So, that is repeating the message again. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural system. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Now, we are not saying extremely likely, we are just saying it is unequivocal because from the science side, you can show statistically that this is a significant unequivocal impact on the, the climate warming. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. Atmosphere and ocean have warmed, amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea levels have risen. So, similarly, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have increased. They are the largest in the last 800,000 years and in fact, now some estimates go back to several million years. Evidence from human influence on the climate system has grown since AR4, which was the previous assessment. Human influence has been detected in warming of the atmosphere, the ocean, changes in global water cycle. So, we are putting more details here. Reductions in snow and ice, global mean sea level rise. It is extremely likely to have been dominant cause of observed warming in the since the mid 20th century. Recent decades, changes in climate have caused impacts on natural and human systems on all continents and irrespective of its cause indicating the sensitivity of natural and human systems to climate change. So, the wordings are slightly modified in the summary for the 
policy makers. Changes in many extreme weather and climate events have been observed since about 1950. Some of these events have been linked to human influences. So again, some more detail compared to the summary, including a decrease in cold temperature extremes, a detail, increase in warm temperature extremes, increase in extreme high sea levels and increase in the number of heavy precipitation events. This is something we discussed as detection and attribution. So now there is a group called ACE, Attribution of Climate Events, which takes an event like let us say the Kerala flood. They make multiple model simulations to show or to see if that event became more extreme because of the warming and the changes in humidity, changes in circulation and so on. So this makes rapid assessment of the detected signal to see if attribution is possible. Okay? The character and severity of impacts from climate change and extreme events emerge from risk that depends not only on climate related hazards, but also on exposure and vulnerability. Exposure basically means the number of people who are vulnerable that are experiencing a certain hazard like the flood or drought or extreme storms and sea level rise and so on. Adaptation and mitigation experience is accumulating across regions and scales even while global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have continued to increase. In other words, we are increasing greenhouse gas emissions but the knowledge and the ability to already begin to adapt and mitigate climate change has been implemented in many places. We saw some examples from each continent and those are beginning to show that in fact there are effective ways in which we can implement these things and show an impact on mitigating and adapting to climate change. In the second section, we look at future climate changes, risks and impacts. Continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and long lasting changes in all components of the climate system. We will probably begin to use more like earth system in the future assessments. Increasing the likelihood of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. Limiting climate change would require substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions which together with adaptation can limit climate change risks. So here we are looking at future climate changes and focusing on risks, mitigation, adaptation and impacts. Key drivers of future climate change of course continued CO2 emissions. They will cause global mean surface warming by the late 21st century and beyond. You remember we learned about delayed warming and committed warming. That's where this beyond comes from. So even if we reach our goals by 2100, the warming will continue. Projections of greenhouse gas emissions vary over a wide range depending on both socio-economic development and climate policy. So we looked at various options of socio-economic development, high energy demand, low energy demand and we looked at various climate policies where carbon taxes, emission trading systems and cooperations at national, international levels, finances for green projects and so on. So those will affect the emissions. So the emissions projections into the future obviously depends a lot on how we balance those costs and risks and benefits. Projected changes in the climate system. Surface temperature is projected to rise over the 21st century, not surprising. It is very likely that heat waves will occur more often and last longer. So they will occur more and last longer. This is already happening that extreme precipitation events will become more intense and frequent. So they will be more intense and they will be more frequent. This is also already beginning to emerge as a clear signal. Ocean will continue to warm and acidify and global mean sea levels will continue to rise. This is also already clear that it's been happening now last few decades. Future risks and impacts caused by a changing climate climate change will amplify existing risks. So there are many places which are like Bangladesh is already been at the risk of severe cyclones with sea level rise and increasing cyclones. The 
risks for them is going to be amplified and also create new risks like exacerbated health impacts and both this will happen both for natural and human systems. So, natural systems include of course, mangroves, corals, glaciers, glacier dependent rivers and so on, coastal ecosystems. Risks are unevenly distributed and are generally greater for disadvantaged people and communities in all countries at all levels of development. So, each country even the rich countries and rich continents have disadvantaged sections and so at a global level disadvantaged countries will have uneven distributions and risks and within a country disadvantaged groups of people or ethnicities will have uneven impacts of climate. Climate change beyond 2100 and irreversibility and abrupt changes. Many aspects of climate change and associated impacts will continue for centuries because of delayed warming and committed warming and the fact that CO2 has a very long residence time in the atmosphere and in the system. Even if anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse are stopped, this will continue for centuries. The risks of abrupt and irreversible climate changes increase as the magnitude of warming increases. So, we looked at several things like Greenland ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet, meridional overturning circulation, Amazon forests, monsoons and so and so on. They are all systems that have the potential for irreversible or no analog states and abrupt shifts to conditions that could be catastrophic. So, in the science part the same section mentions continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and long lasting changes which we already said for people and ecosystems. Limiting climate change would require substantial and sustained reductions. Surface temperature is projected to rise over the 21st century under all assessed scenarios we looked at. The main goal there was to see which scenario will give us less than 2 degree centigrade warming which is based on the past climate considered kind of the manageable limit. Remember about managing the unavoidable and avoiding the unmanageable as best as we can. So, this is kind of trying to stay within manageable limits. It is very likely that heat waves will occur more often, last longer, extreme precipitations will become more intense, oceans will acidify and sea level will rise. Climate change will amplify risks and climate irreversible impacts, continued high emissions would lead to more negative impacts for biodiversity which is a detail that is not there in summary for policy makers. Ecosystem services, economic development will they will have amplified risks for livelihood for food and human security. So, if warming continues to become damaging to crops and crop yields in addition to causing health impacts, loss, labor and so on, then livelihoods are going to be very severely affected. Many aspects of climate change and its associated impacts will continue. Irreversible changes will increase in probability with increased warming. Future pathways for adaptation, mitigation and sustainable development. This was kind of a heavy section with very complicated graphs which required us to kind of look at it carefully and we looked at costs, various options, various sectors like transportation, buildings, economics, uh, socio-economic systems and so on. So, adaptation and mitigation are complementary strategies. We started with the Venn diagram where we saw that for reducing and managing risks of climate change. That is the first thing you have to remember. Substantial emission reductions over the next few decades can reduce climate risks for 21st century and beyond. Increase prospects for effective adaptation, reduce the costs and challenges of mitigation in the longer term and contribute to climate resilient pathways for sustainable development. Climate resilient pathways. So, the sooner we start the less it will cost contain the damage into the future. So, it is a kind of a choice we have to make. How convinced are you that this investment is worth it? 
So, in the human behavior I did not mention one thing, it is how human perception of risk itself changes. For example, anybody who has a kid, now even before the kid is born, even as soon as you get married, you might start saving for the child's future college fund and so on. But it is very hard for people to pay tax to save the environment for their own children or grandchildren. Somehow we are very clear about them needing a college education, but we do not think so much about how to pay to keep the environment safe and clean for them when they grow up. So, they are very different sense of risk and those are very detailed psychoanalysis of how climate change perception uh, risk of climate change perception, uh, how is it related on uh, which culture you grow up in, what kind of adversity you have faced in the, f in the past. So, groups in general which have faced adversity and resource limitation usually tend to be more adapting to the message that climate change is a risk and they will take more actions to mitigate and adapt compared to cultures that may have had no exposure to adversity and re, uh, resource limitation. Foundations of decision making about climate change. So, the risk perception affect decision making at individual level, community level and na national level. Effective decision making to limit climate change and its effects can be informed by a wide range of analytical approaches for evaluating expected risks and benefits, recognizing the importance of governance ethical dimensions, equity, value judgments, economic assessments and diverse perceptions and responses to risk and uncertainty. So, you can already see the discussion under the UNFCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which is managing the IPCC that different nations respond differently to the value of what the impact of climate change are, value of life lost and economic assessments of the impacts of climate change and the perceptions and responses depend on again cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds. Climate change risks reduced by mitigation and adaptation. This is already evident. So, it is just a question of how much more you are going to ramp up the investments in mitigation and adaptation and it may depend on what kind of issues you are already facing. If there is a region, let us say Siberia which is getting warmer and nicer and there is no loss yet, they might say okay, maybe more warming will be better because we can begin to grow wheat again and so on. So, it depends on where you are and what you are experiencing. Without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today and even with adaptation, warming by the end of 21st century will lead to high and very high risk of severe, widespread and irreversible impacts globally. As I said, this is said with high confidence based on all the knowledge and the modeling we can do. But if you are not susceptible or vulnerable or not facing risk right now, how are the risks and vulnerabilities of your neighbors going to affect you? That is also a concern here. So, that is why it is called globally. Mitigation involves some level of co-benefits and of risks due to adverse side effects. So, we saw some potential adverse side effects in that table we saw of uh, costs of mitigation across various sectors. So, there are these are experiments. So, whenever you do this kind of experiments on a natural system, you can expect that some of them will be like Frankenstein experiments where you might produce an consequence that was unintended or unexpected. There are many examples of such potential uh, adverse side effects. But these risks do not involve the same possibility of severe, widespread and irreversible impacts as risks from climate change, increasing the benefit from near mitigation efforts. So, there is a argument that even though there are potential adverse side effects, those risks from adverse side effects are much smaller than and much severe, much less widespread and less likely to be irreversible as the impacts we get from climate change itself.
We haven't gone so much into other geoengineering aspects like let's say going into the stratosphere and spreading some aerosols because remember from volcanoes we say that when volcanoes go off the earth cools for a few years, right? So can we create an artificial cooling by spraying aerosols? Such an experiment will be done very soon by somebody at least as an experiment to see what happens. Those are called solar radiation management experiments. But you have to remember that even if you did solar radiation management experiment and temporarily cooled the climate, the CO2 is still in the system. Acidification will still continue and as soon as you remove the solar radiation management that you are doing, the warming will pick right back up. So it is not a permanent solution. Carbon capture and sequestration on the other hand may be permanent if you can properly hide the carbon and take it out on large enough scale. So if you want to motivate your students to learn these things, focus on solutions, then you have to teach them what are the issues for which solutions are needed. Could be health, could be water management, food, energy and solar radiation management or geoengineering. But you have to always ask them to follow up with risks and cost benefit analysis and so on. So those are always issues that we must remember. Characteristics of adaptation pathways. Adaptation can reduce the risk of climate change impacts but there are limits to its effectiveness especially with greater magnitudes and rates of climate change. So if the climate change suddenly begins to accelerate then you cannot really depend completely on adaptation. There are limitations and to the effectiveness. Taking a longer term perspective in the context of sustainable development increases the likelihood that more immediate adaptation actions will enhance future options and preparedness. So we should immediately begin to adapt. It could be simple things like developing rules for dam operations. For example, many times when there are floods, they are related to dams not being operated properly despite having reliable forecasts of floods, for example. Those kinds of things can be implemented and people train to respond quickly so that loss of life and property is, is reduced uh, and so on. So sustainable is a word that is used like biodiversity, maybe you know what that means. Essentially it means it is a resource that you use without jeopardizing the potential for future generations to exploit the same resource. Sounds very nice but it is not easy to implement in a rules and regulations. Characteristic mitigation pathways, there are multiple mitigation pathways that are likely to limit the warming to below 2 degree centigrade relative to pre-industrial level. These pathways would require substantial emission reductions over the next few decades and near zero emissions of CO2 and other long lived greenhouse gases by the end of the century. So we have to drop below current levels by the end of the century. Implementing such reduction poses substantial technological, economic, social, institutional challenges which increase with delays in additional mitigation and if key technologies are not available. So there are potentially all these mitigation strategies, technologies that are possible but we must get started very quickly and we will still face a lot of debates and oppositions and doubts about it. Limiting warming to lower or higher levels involves similar challenges but different time scales. Okay? So adaptation mitigation, many adaptation mitigation options can help address climate change but no single option is sufficient by itself. Effective implementation depends on policies and cooperation at all time scales, at all spatial and temporal scales and can be enhanced through integrated responses that link adaptation and mitigation with other social objectives. Common enabling factors and constraints include responses as underpinned by common enabling factors which include effective institutions and governance, innovation and investments in environmentally sound technologies and infrastructure, sustainable livelihoods and behavioral and lifestyle choices. As I said, these are not easy but if you think about smoking, people now have reduced smoking by a lot. 
there are other issues of electronic smoking and so on. But nonetheless, at some point some externality kicked in and people decided that smoking is not good. So, there is a large scale reduction in smoking. Is it possible that your children will grow up and think pollution is bad, we should not pollute and suddenly adopt a lot of environmentally friendly ways? Of course, possible. Response options for adaptation, they exist in all sectors. Their context of implementation and potential to reduce climate related risks differs across sectors and regions. Some adaptation responses involve significant co-benefits, synergies and trade-offs. So, they are always coupled. Increasing climate change will increase the challenges for many adaptation options. So, if you are ne living near the coast, increasing sea level is going to make not options anymore. Response options to mitigation, again available in every sector, can be more cost effective if using integrated approach similar to adaptation. Measures to reduce energy use, greenhouse gas intensity of end use sectors, decarbonize energy supply, so reduce the carbon intensity of energy, reduce net emissions and enhance carbon sinks in land based sectors, so afforestation and so on. Policy approaches, technology and finance, we looked at those effective adaptation mitigation responses depending on policies, measures across multiple scales, so international, regional, national and subnational. Policies across all scales supporting technology development, diffusion and transfer. Again, if this is to happen at international scale, then lot of ethical decisions have to be made. People want to make money or reduce global warming, that will be a choice. As well as finance for responses to climate change, which then complement and enhance effectiveness of policies to promote adaptation and mitigation. Trade-offs, synergies and interactions as with sustainable development. Climate change is a threat to sustainable development. So, with globally connected economy, we can easily see that if one country becomes too poor to purchase anything, it is going to affect the countries that are trying to sell things. So, it is nobody is really an island anymore. Nonetheless, there are many opportunities to link mitigation, adaptation and the pursuit of other social objectives through integrated responses. We can say that with high confidence. Successful implementation relies on relevant tools, suitable governance structures enhanced capacity to respond to them with somewhat less confidence. So, coming to closer to the end, adaptation mitigations are complementary. Effective decision making to limit climate change and its effects can be informed by a wide range of analytical approaches that we already mentioned. Without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today, even with adaptation and warming, the warming at the end of 21st century will lead to high to very high risk of severe widespread irreversible impacts. Adaptation can reduce the risks of climate change impacts. Fortunately, we already have many evidences for it. So, the increasing likelihood of immediate adaptation actions will definitely affect future options and preparedness. So, which means the value judgments or whatever other judgments are involved, somehow collectively we have to decide now. And many countries like Netherlands, Norway and Canada and uh, so on have done several things that are ahead like Sweden, Denmark in terms of renewable energies and so on. So, how many people will not wait for the globe to react and start doing their own things? This is going to be key as, as well as how the countries continue to agree to do things together. Multiple mitigation pathways to, to remain below 2 degrees centigrade obviously. Limiting the warming to lower and higher levels involves many challenges on different time scales. So, we went through some of those things. Finally, you have to remember that climate change is a threat to equitable and sustainable development. Now, the development pretty much has to look at global scales. There are very nice work by people like Dale Herman. He has some simple rules on how to make economy as part of the environment instead of thinking economic growth, you can think of economic development. There was a retail salesman called Victor Lebo who only after World War II 
wrote a little paper saying that to make the economy grow forever, we must build things that don't last very long. Whether it's cell phones, washing machines, cars, TVs, whatever, you build things that people have to junk it and buy a new one in a few years. Very prophetic, turned out to be true that this is a way to grow the global economy. But we have now realized that we are constantly converting natural resources into chunk that is not biodegradable like plastic and this is an irreversible transformation. So now we are learning that maybe that's not a good strategy. So how do we keep expanding the economy without harming the environment? This is critical. So climate change is now acting on top of that threat to equitable development. Adaptation, mitigation and sustainable development are closely related with potential for synergies and trade-offs. So it's a kind of a long story, but very interlinked processes, problems, solutions, and interlinked futures for all of us. So how you extract the most important parts to deliver to your students as a course in the context of modern climate change and solutions and your regional observations of what is changing in your backyard, you have to kind of do some work. So sit with all the material and then pick and choose to fit your schedule and fit the time you have to highlight the most important points. Greenhouse gas increase and warming and sea level rise extreme events are the most important ones. But what we do about it depends entirely on human behavior, human governance, political decisions, economic decisions and so on. So should be fun. We'll come back and talk more specifically about climate impacts on India and then the monsoon. So see you next time.